We'll go ahead and get started on the uh, pest management part of the, of the program. Again, going a little bit more in depth, why are insects so successful? They've been around for hundreds and thousands of years. Um, small size, they don't eat, need to eat much. Actually, if their food source dries up, they can survive without food for quite some time with this, this bed bug thing um, in, the, in the hotels. You know, if just because somebody else stay in that room for a while, that bed bug can actually survive uh, several weeks without any food source. So insects can go a long time without having a specific uh, food requirement. Um, very rapid and prolific uh, reproduction. We talked about, the uh, Jim was mentioned yesterday about the spotted wing Drosophila and some of the aphid life cycles, how they, they can just uh, turn over new, new young real fast, especially aphids that can actually lay, get through the egg stage, not even produce eggs, they just go right to, to new live aphids. Um, they grow by molting, so that means they have different coverings of their skin and they can just shed that skin and and go through that, uh, that different life cycle. And then the life stages, um, they can feed on different substrates. They don't need the same thing all the time. So that, that also helps them with surviving in our fruit and vegetable fields. We've been hearing it all week though, high tunnels, perfect environment for, for uh, insects as well as disease to proliferate inside those tunnels. Um, it's real hot, humid, good conditions for, for our insect pests. Uh, very dry on the leaf surface. We talked about spider mites yesterday, how a rainfall is the best insecticide or control measure for spider mites. We don't get no rainfall in the tunnel, so that helps with uh, those insects overwintering and staying in those tunnels. And then the high planting density, diversity of the crops that we can raise in high tunnels, a lot of host plants there that these insects can feed on. Bottom line though, when it comes to the environment and pest control, reiterating what everybody else said, prevention is better than a cure, uh, especially if we're going to go more the biological route or the beneficial insect route. And we need to manage the insects where they are. That's why we've been stressing all week the importance of checking underneath the leaves and getting into that plant can canopy to do our, to do our scouting. Um, again, bottom line, prevention is better than a cure. Manage insects when they are small in numbers. We don't want to wait until that insect uh, population has gotten way high. We showed some of the data coming out of New York from Judd Reed's research where the beneficial insects didn't quite work when that population spiked really high. Um, he had a hard time bringing them down. So if we can get them control measures implemented early on when that population is low, we're going to have better control measures. But any intervention in insect activity is better than doing nothing. Um, can't take a laissez-faire approach to insect management uh, inside the high tunnels because eventually the insect's probably going to win. Need to be able to identify the different plant injuries that insects can, can do on our high tunnel crops. Um, leaf feeding would be injury when you actually have the fruit out there. That fruit's not going to be able to be sold, is it? Therefore we have damage. That insect's caused damage. Plants can actually take a little bit of feeding. Um, we as growers cannot take damage. That fruit being damaged, that's just made it a number, a number two or a call. It's not going to be able to go to market for us. Insects can cause direct injury by feeding with their chewing mouth parts and as well as their sucking uh, mouth parts. Um, we talked about the spotted wing Drosophila and how them berries can actually have those eggs inside the, the fruit. We don't even know it. They have this ovipositor that the insect can actually go and saw in. The regular fruit fly we get on our bananas and so forth around the, around the kitchen table, um, she, don't, she can just go into that soft fruit and lay eggs. The spotted wing Drosophila has an ovipositor, has like a barb on it, like a, like a jigsaw, and she can actually cut herself a hole into that green fruit and lay the egg in there. So that's usually the injury we get. It usually shows up with a dimpling on the fruit like that or in the case of the spider wing Drosophila, the egg mass is uh, being deposited within that fruit and then the larvae of the maggots coming out. Um, indirect injury from in insect uh, pest, the honeydew or sooty mold. If the aphids are feeding and they bring that sugary substance to the leaf surface, that leaf surface can actually go ahead and cause some of that sooty mold or fungus to grow on the leaves. So that can get on our leaves, it can get on our tomatoes, it can get on our fruit, it can cause a lot of injury that way as well. 
We talked about aphids and thrips yesterday. They are the ho they have to transmit the viruses due to feeding. Um, they can transmit the cucumber mosaic virus, potato virus. Um, thrips can transmit the tomato spotted wilt virus. All things we need to be aware of inside our high tunnels. So what is integrated pest management? An integrated pest management is a threshold-based decision management system which leads to the judicious use of multiple pest control pot products. Um, currently, IPM is pretty insecticide uh, intensive. Every IPM program you look at, somewhere in that system is an insect or an insecticide that you would choose to use. Major losses, though, occurred a lack of early detection of insects, uh, insect, insecticide resistance by misuse. We were talking about controlling these uh, spotted wing Drosophila. Eventually, we're going to run out of insecticides that we can use just because of the long time that we're having to control those pests. And then a la loss of natural control with insecticides. Decision making in IPM, um, all week long we've been talking about Detection, early detection, early monitoring. Uh, we've got a lot of good handouts in your, in your packets there on actual making identifications of those pests. Uh, if you can't identify it, you don't know what you're controlling. Monitoring the population pressure. That can be done with sticky traps. It can be done by walking through your, through your high tunnel and doing counts of how many aphids are on the plants. You reach a point of economic threshold. When you use beneficial insects, that economic threshold can be pretty low because we got to get those beneficials in there earlier on. If we're going to be using insecticides, we'll have a certain count. For almost every pest, we have a certain threshold level we need to hit before we go ahead and implement a control measure. But to, to make this treatment decision, how do we make that treatment decision, is more of a three-tiered approach when it comes to IPM. Level one. Systemic uh, based, systems based practices. We've touched on a lot of that this week. That's the sanitation, crop rotation, using trap crops, cultural practice we're using, the ventilation, the pruning, everything we've already talked about this week. That's where it all starts. If we can do that right, putting that uh, tunnel in a good location, up on top of a hill rather than down in a gully or so forth where it's going to have a bunch of uh, runoff down into the tunnel. Uh, level two. Mechanical and physical practices. That would be you're using our lures, our traps, repellents, hand picking. The net house, again, something we haven't done too much work with, but Shubin mentioned it yesterday. They've done some work in Alabama on it. Um, our greenhouse producers, our hydroponic producers, even some of you have said you're using uh, some of the net houses and some of the exclusion netting within our high tunnels to keep the pest out. Uh, level three. Of a, of a program would be the biorational or other materials. Those are the OMRI approved. We went over that yesterday. The Organic Material Review Institute approved insecticides. Those are pretty well going to be pretty well all available to us high tunnel producers. If you're organic, that's all you've got. But there are about 6,000 different types of fertilizers, fungicides, insecticides, so forth that can be used that are OMRI approved. Um, Jim had to leave with us today. He's not going to be able to join. He's actually, like he said, doing the uh, spotted wing Drosophila training up on campus today. But Jim's heads up our Ohio IPM program, and he's responsible for implementing a statewide trapping program. Um, and these are actually some shots from some work we're doing with Jim throughout the state on monitoring for stink bugs. The brown marmorade stink bug is a pest that's really coming in from the East Coast with uh, Pretty big vengeance, especially down here in southern Ohio, but it's not, hasn't really impacted our crops yet. Our homeowners are going nuts with it because in the fall, uh, they're just getting thousands and thousands of these brown marmorade stink bugs coming in onto their porches and coming into the house. Knock on wood, it hasn't hit our fruit and vegetable farmers yet, but eventually I think they're going to get a hankering for our fruit and vegetable crops. So um, this is a trapping program that we have implemented. I take care of a few traps down around these parts and sweet corn and berry crops. Uh, still looking at, I don't know about the other universities, but um, we're looking at different colors to see if they're more attracted, if the brown marmorade stink bug is more attracted to certain colors, different lures. Um, but anyway, when it comes to monitoring our pest in our high tunnel production, 
it's the uh, trapping that's going to help us because some of these pests are so small that we really can't see them just walking through the patch. You might, if you see them fluttering up at you, you know it's too late. But if you have a, uh, a trapping system out that usually has a pheromone within it, that pheromone is an attractant to the different types of pests. There's different pheromones for, for different types of pests we're trying to do. Like this one, here's a sticky wing trap. That's a corn rootworm type of a trap. You have the stink, the, the stink bug trap. And then this afternoon or later this morning, we're going to give you the sheet we were talking about yesterday from Celeste Weldy on how you can go and take an old peanut butter jar and make your own spotted wing drosophila uh, trap. So um, it has to start with trapping because not always can you see those pests within your, within your uh, plantings. Being able to identify the pest is very important to a control program. Monitoring scouting techniques. Uh, you can use a sweet net. Uh, you can use the pheromone traps like we just showed you. Um, that difference between damage on our fruit that we're actually wanting to produce and harvest may want to intensify your scouting at that fruit setting because there you're not only dealing with the damage that they're going to cause to the fruit but also you're having to monitor for the damage in the population built up within the plant canopy itself. Uh, just a good example, an economic threshold, 0.25 bugs per 10 plants at the green fruit stage. You'll see this in the ID56 that uh, Schumann's talking about. We do have some thresholds where you would make a, you know, go ahead and implement a control program for those pests, depending on the populations. Um, being able to identify what the plants are. Uh, this is greenhouse whitefly, silverleaf whitefly. Again, you'd have to have, these are very small critters, so you'd have to have some type of a, a program set up that you can monitor those on a, on a regular basis. But they have the piercing sucking mouth parts that, that can damage the fruit and damage our crop. Eggs are laid on the plants. Uh, crawlers are nymphs. They feed on one location. Uh, 30 days for one generation. Higher temperatures may inhibit the white flies. And then there is some uh, Shubin and Lewis were talking about some of the biological controls we can use. Here we have an Encarcia formosa as a biological control for these white flies. Another, which one's that? Different aphids. Different green peach aphid, potato aphid. Uh, we mentioned it yesterday, but a large host range. <coughs> aphids can feed just about on any of our, uh, our fruit and vegetable crops. Mounting, uh, monitoring and scouting techniques, sample 10 plants in several locations, use the yellow sticky traps at the field's edge or throughout the high tunnel. Uh, they do like cool, dry weather. Uh, watch for the ants and lady beetles. Why would they be around? To eat the aphids, and why would the ants be there? They're eating the, the sticky, the sooty mold, the sticky substance that, they're, uh, that those uh, aphids are, are releasing. An economic threshold we usually look for is 50% of the leaves would be covered with, uh, with aphids, and that's time to go ahead. And pretty easy to control. Like we said yesterday, they're a soft-bodied insect, so just using an in, uh, insecticidal soap type of application will help control the aphids. Um, but we talked about thrips yesterday, and Matt's mentioned how thrips are you know, also in our cabbage crops as well. They get down into those leaves. But on the thrips, we can use the sticky cards, either yellow or blue sticky cards. Um, the bag and shake technique where we actually just uh, um, take that leaf or take the fruit or what have you and shake it up in there and shake them off the leaves, get them off the leaves, get them off the fruit. We can actually uh, pull some and get some of the thrips off of there because they do stick onto that and leaves and onto that fruit. Uh, no really action threshold, but if you find one or two, especially in a crop like cabbage, we can get down in that leaf uh, in, in between those leaves, then you probably need to uh, do pretty quick uh, control measures for the thrips. When it comes to tomatoes, there are some resistant varieties. Some of these we raise here in the, in the Midwest still, BHN 444, 589, 640, and then Bella Rosa. They have shown to have some more resistance to thrips um, as well as the virus that they transmit. What is that? It's a flea beetle. Flea beetles can get us, especially in these cool, like now, when we got cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, tomatoes, eggplant out in the fields here early season, um, the flea beetles can come in just real tiny pests, cause all these little tiny feeding injury and holes on the leaves. Uh, can actually start marring up some of the fruit. Usually once the season starts to progress though and it gets warmer, 
the flea beetle population drops. They'll be hanging around for a little bit, but usually more of a cool season pest for us here in, uh, here in Ohio. Flea beetles can also transmit, if you're a sweet corn grower, can transmit some, uh, some diseases in our sweet corn that, uh, that can hurt us if we, if we don't get them under control. And they're just little tiny black, black insects and fly around real fast. You can see them hopping around down in there. Monitor that uh, level of defoliation not really getting on the fruit per se at this stage, but they're more um, impacting that, uh, the feeding injury on the plant itself. But sample small plants with the sweet net uh, during morning hours. If you just get down your hands and knees, like if you have sweet corn now, like at Fred Weaver's place, he had sweet corn on the plastic, you can actually get down underneath that plastic and see the flea beetles if you do have them. Um, get them in the morning because in the afternoons it starts getting warm and they can go down into the plant canopy or go down into the soil. Um, Observe the activity of the parasitoids, predators, if there's some of those out there, because there are some natural predators that can help us control the flea beetle. And then uh, economic thresholds, 5 to 10 percent defoliation early season, 25 to 30 percent defoliation uh, mid-season. But again, like Shubin said, the earlier we can detect them and hit a threshold and start getting that control measure under control, the better off we're going to be. Uh, we talked a lot about spider mites. Uh, I think Lewis said if we get to this stage, we start seeing webbing you're a little too late. We need to get those spider mites under control We're early. Inside the high tunnels when it's dry and hot, we're not doing, we've eliminated overhead watering. We can actually get some spikes in the spider, two spotted spider mites uh, pretty quick within the tunnel. The simple technique I told you all yesterday, you know, if you're suspecting them, just take that white piece of paper, smash that leaf on them. If you see a bunch of red dots on there, uh, you know you probably got some spider mites. But they are a major pests for our open field and high tunnel crops on our fruit and vegetable crops. Um, if you get this extensive webbing, it's a pretty, pretty much too late in order to control that, control that pest. It's going to be hard to get them under control. They do build up real fast in the hot, dry weather. And difficult to control with approved pesticides, there are specific miticides. Uh, I think Lewis says he's had some good luck with acromite uh, in his high tunnel work. Um, but you have to use a miticide because these are mites. They're a little different than our uh, different control measure than our standard insecticides. Um, a 10x hand lens. We mentioned that earlier in the week. If you can carry that with you, you should be able to pull up those spider mites enough to to identify them on the leaves. Uh, females are larger than the males. Um, the, the adults have the oval stage. The eggs are glued to the webbing. Underside of the leaves, leaf tips. Again, you're not going to be able to just walk through that greenhouse and look down. You're going to have to get down underneath that plant canopy and look up on the undersides of the leaves. Had a pretty wide host range, you know, not just fruit and vegetable crops, but they get real bad on soybean crops and some of our other uh, agronomic crops as well. Tomato russet mite, um, not as bad in Ohio here. We have the tomato spotted, a uh, two-spotted spider mite is more prevalent in our, in our crops than the tomato russet mite, but we have, some, have had some reports of tomato russet mite, but they are a little bit smaller. And the two-spotted spider mite, they need a little bit larger hand lens to be able to identify those. The adults are elongated, um, right there, a little bit longer than the, than the oval-shaped uh, two-spotted spider mites. Um, infestation usually starts from the lower leaves, and that brings up another point on spider mites, especially in the fields or in the tunnel. If you do start getting a population buildup, you might notice it first on the outsides of the tunnel because um, they'll be coming in from the outside in the grass or in other weed areas or, or other areas around. They have to move themselves into the tunnel. Even in a field situation, you'll see the damage showing up right along a ditch bank or, or a, a fence row first before you see it, most times, before you see it out in the middle of the field. Um, Right around them leaf edges, stems, fruits, that's where you'll start seeing the uh, spider mites feeding on. And then the solanaceous crops, your tomatoes, eggplant, those are the host plants for a uh, tomato russet mite. Um, Two-spotted spider mite, if you see curling, now we did see some curling at the Weber's on Monday morning. That was not the, I know some of you asked whether that was a disease or, or insect pressure in there. That was just natural physiological feet, uh, leaf roll after Matt and I took a look at it and everybody else uh, took a look at it. But you can get some of this leaf curling 
That's from that mite on that leaf and it's feeding and it's just sucking the sap out of that leaf, making it curl up. Um, you'll get some of the webbing. Hopefully you catch it before you see the webbing. And then you'll get a slight bronzing of that tomato leaf when you get the, when you get the mites feeding on that. And the tomato russet mite, if you do get that one, similar type of injury, but a more greasy look, russeting color to the, uh, to the leaf. And then the leaf just suddenly dries out, especially in the lower leaves if they've, if they've really uh, started feeding on those leaves a lot. Trap cropping, just what Sue was bringing up. Um, insects have different host preferences. So we can actually plant some trap crops in, around our high tunnels, around our fruit and vegetable fields, which will attract the bad bugs to those crops before they get into our good crops that we're trying to grow and market. Um, insects may feed and reproduce within that preferred host, whether it's sorghum, whether it's sunflowers, lots of different types of trap crops we can use, but they may end up just crawling into that trap crop first because they prefer that crop over our tomato crop or our pepper crop or our other tunnel crops. Insect netting, we've been talking about that this week and we'd probably like to adopt that technology a little bit more in our tunnels. But if we can just put the netting along the outside, I think Shubin showed us some pictures of uh, some of the netting that they were using on some of their tunnels. But this exclusion netting can just keep those pests from coming into, into our tunnels. Uh, easier to control pests to an extent within the tunnels rather than the open field. We can't net a whole open field, but we can go ahead and net a tunnel or a greenhouse uh, and keep those pests from making their way in. When we use biological control agents or natural enemies, we'll go, we gave you that nice sheet that was put together by the entomology group up at Worcester to sh show you some of the uh, beneficials that help us as fruit and vegetable growers out in the field. But just a little bit more in depth than we went over yesterday. We got the predators, those would be the ladybugs and the spiders. They would, they're general feeders, uh, eat lots of prey, uh, larger and stronger um, than the prey. You know, problems within the house, in our houses, they come in, in, in groves in the fall, but if we could actually just take those and vacuum them up and put them out into the fields and in tunnels, uh, those lady beetles are gonna do us some good out there. So lady beetles, are can be a nuisance in our houses, but out in the field we, uh, we, can, we have a bunch of them. If you look at your sheet there, there are, I didn't know until they did the study how many different types of lady beetles there were and how they can all benefit. You may even see, there's not a good picture here, we should have thrown one in, I don't think, but you may even go out into your fields or into your plants and you'll see these little black, they look like baby alligators. That's the larval stage. That's the early stage of the lady beetle. So you may see these little black crawling things that are real long, look like little baby alligators, but don't go and spray them. Don't try to kill them. Those are the next, those are gonna be uh, the lady beetles that are gonna go ahead and help us control those pests in the future. Uh, some more examples of predators. And again, these are on your, uh, on your handout sheet there, but uh, lady beetles, there's a picture of the larvae. I did put one in this morning. I was working on this this morning. So it looks like a, they just call them the baby alligators. Uh, green lace wings, that's the larvae. There's the eggs. If you look real close, it's really neat. You see these eggs that are um, deposited on these big long stalks when she lays them uh, on, the, on the leaves. So if you see those, that's actually the green lace wing that's helping, helping you control some of the bad bugs in your, in your tunnel. Uh, Hoverflies, robber flies, the assassin bugs. Um, I'm just wondering if... Uh, Terry was telling us the other day about those black bugs. I don't wonder if he had some assassin bugs and actually I wonder if they were good ones instead of bad ones. One of the growers we went to was trying to explain a bug that he thought was, uh, never has given us a sample of it, but was trying to explain what, they, uh, what that bug was out in his tunnel. Um, the spine soldier bug, uh, orb weavers, the entomologists I work with, uh, Chelsea Smith and Mary Gardner, they just love these, these spiders. They, they think they do a great job with controlling the pest in our fields and our tunnels. But orb weavers, crab spiders, uh, all different kinds of spiders will also help us. So those are a good thing. If you see spiders inside the tunnel of the greenhouse, uh, don't go stepping on them and getting rid of them. Those are going to be good things that are going to help us control the pest. Some of the parasitoids, uh, the trichogramma wasps, the aphidus wasps, tachnid flies, um, those are all three good beneficial insects that will help us uh, control pests within our tunnels as well. We need to conserve the natural enemies though. Like we've been mentioning all week, watch your pesticide applications because you, you can actually make an application for a pest, but then you can knock out 
the uh, natural pe uh, natural enemies that are in there helping us uh, helping us control the control the pests within our high tunnels. Don't be quick to reach for the pesticide spray. You know, have that be an option. I think that pesticides are an option for, for IPM programs, but uh, don't jump to that conclusion right at first. I think there's a lot of other options available to us as farmers um, to control these pests prior to using the insecticide. But we limit them as much as you can. Uh, use the pesticides that are compatible with biological control. We mentioned the BT, the Bacillus thuringiensis, which really helps us with um, mainly the worm control within our tunnels. And then the neem oils, so those are some of the botanical types of sprays that we can use within our, within our tunnels. Uh, getting back to what Sue was to ask in there earlier, um, if we can provide foods that adults need, uh, certain types of flowering plants uh, planted around the farm, or around the tunnel, or around the greenhouse, or even around the borders of the field. I think that's a field of alyssum right there. Um, those can actually be attractive, attracting crops for these beneficial insects. They are out there naturally. I was telling you how we did the uh, camera thing on our pumpkin blossoms, and had the cameras on the pumpkin blooms from four in the morning to four in the afternoon, and we sat there and watching what just the natural pollinators we had out there in our fields were, and on this farm, our big natural pollinators, bumblebees. We have a lot of bumblebees. Well, all these beneficial insects are out there in the wild. We just need to bring them into our, uh, into our fields, into closer to our tunnels, and encourage the development of those crops. But if you grow a mixture, a diversity of, of plants, you can do a seed mix, seed it all around the fence rows. Uh, we've done some of that research out here in the, in the pumpkin fields where we planted some alyssum mixed with a few other attractive crops for beneficial pollinators as well as natural enemies. But we want to have a continuous source of flowers. Keep that long bloom time. We just don't want to have one quick alyssum crop and then be done. We want to have that mix consist of a lot of crops that will give us an extended bloom time throughout the, throughout the season. Um, here's a sorghum trap crop that was planted on two sides of the tunnel. That can act as a barrier to uh, pest migration into the, into the tunnel. Sorghum and sunflowers, they can be trap crops. They can actually get into those, uh, those two crops before they go ahead and get into our high tunnels. How far away are you You don't want to, like sorghum and sunflowers, you don't want to have them close enough that it's going to impact your airflow. And then you've got to watch some of the seeds. You know, if these go to seed, then that can actually be a weed problem sometime down the road. But you still want to go f about as far away as you would if you're going to locate another tunnel uh, next to it just to help keep that airflow uh, moving throughout the tunnel. Uh, a few more uh, pest management tips for our high tunnels. Again, just reiterating what we've already talked about, but practice that sanitation, strict weed control. The weeds can actually harbor a lot of these pests that can cause us problems. Uh, regular irrigation, just reduce the stress to those plants. I think we've been hitting that every day as well, going clear back to what the farmers told us. A scout weekly or a daily um, to find those hot spots before they enlarge and get any worse within the high tunnel and maybe even keep that treatment down to just those hot spots. Um, different choices, conventional, organic, foliar, drip irrigation, um, different types of ways that we can, uh, we can uh, uh, apply those different treatments. Uh, just a few of the organic approved insecticides, and again, I would refer to the OMRI list because that OMRI list is getting updated, I think, daily. They, I get an update whenever something's put on that, and it almost is daily. We're getting things usually put on. Not many things are coming off the OMRI list, but most of the time there's new products being added. But there's different types of BT products. Uh, those are two, two different uh, brand names. Uh, Spinosad and Trust. Uh, I think Lewis was talking about that, how he's using some of that in his work. Uh, pyrethrins, uh, the neem, different types of neem mixes. Um, insectos, insecticidal oils work good, but watch them when it gets hot in these tunnels because they may be OMRI approved, but if you put them on a plant that's hot within the uh, high tunnel, you can actually get some burning. Um, and then, going clear back to what the Webers told us first thing there Monday morning, they buy a brand new sprayer every year, whether they're going to use it or not, but they want a brand new sprayer within that tunnel in case they need to make an application. It's going to be calibrated right. I'm just going to put on a good, uh, good source of spray for them. And they, they think it's a small investment just to buy that backpack sprayer every year. 
But if you can, use that biological control whenever possible. Um, you can mix that along with some uh, OMRI approved insecticides uh, when you first detect any of those pests. And then continue that until you've either dropped your threshold levels down that no longer warrants a, an application. But like Jim was mentioned yesterday, you might be able to knock out that first adult stage and then come back a few days or weeks later, depending on the life cycle and what pests we're after, and then knock out that, that second generation. Um, reduce your insecticide use when using non-selected type of uh, insecticides. I think we said this from the very beginning, treat the bottom sides of the leaves. Uh, it's easy to forget, but you need to control the bottom, uh, make that application to the bottom side of the leaf as well. Uh, mix up a fresh spray solution. I'm seeing too many problems out in the field where the farmers, because of bad water or what have you, a high alkaline water, they're putting in these expensive insecticides or fungicides or spray, mixing them up with the water that they have coming out of the tap, and it's very high alkaline. Some of these pesticides can become ineffective very fast. It's called alkaline hydrolysis. Uh, it can be herbicides, insecticides, fungicides. I, I, I work with farmers that, Brad, we're spending the money, we're spraying. I see them out spraying, but they're not getting the control. They're not getting the disease control. They're not getting the insect control. They're not getting the, the weed control. And finally, we start checking, and their water is so high in alkalinity that they don't have much time. With the half-life of some of these uh, chemicals, could be minutes if you got high enough uh, pH of your spray water. So don't... Uh, you just go ahead and know what your pH of your water is and then there's different buffering agents that you can add or additives you can add that will drop that pH down. You have vinegar, apple cider vinegar, apple juice, it all brings it down. Now you got to watch that because those aren't officially labeled as to be used in that manner so you got to watch that label a little bit when you're using that but that's what you're after is a, an acidifying agent that will drop that pH of that spray water. And usually, you know, like the, the big grain farmers, they automatically just acidify that water uh, for Roundup applications and so forth. But the, if you have the acid water for your spray solution, um, you really can't go wrong with that. And then just calibrating that sprayer. That's a give me, but sometimes as farmers we get so wrapped up in everything that we're doing that we forget. But you should calibrate that sprayer, make sure you're putting on the right volumes, and don't, don't cut yourself short on water. Water is basically free for us and we're carrying them chemicals down into the canopy with water the more water the better don't skimp yourselves you know like when we're talking fields don't try to get about 10 15 20 gallons of water per acre put the water down in there especially when you have a big plant canopy to get those those pesticides down under those leaves and down into the, down into the plant canopy you won't need as much at a young transplant stage but as that plant gets older um, and you've seen some of the pictures of some of those tomato plants once they get full blown at the jungle out there you're going to need some quite a bit of water to get that pesticide moved down into that plant canopy if you do uh, you should change these nozzles every so many years you'll just watch them when you do your calibration if you see you're starting to get way off from what that uh, spray pattern was intended for the nozzle uh, go ahead and replace those Lots of good publications. Y'all are taking home a bunch of publications that are going to help you uh, refer and use as reference materials down the road. Um, we will get you the website. That's why Ohio State went with the uh, Midwest Vegetable Production Guide because Ohio State was trying to really jack up the price on uh, on the Midwest or the Ohio Vegetable Production Guide. And by joining forces with all the other universities now, you can get it up free online again. Back. Uh, Ohio State was wanting to charge you for, for a PDF copy or you couldn't even get it free off, the, off the, their website, but now today you can, so we'll get you that ID56. I don't think I put it on here. And we put into this uh, VegNet newsletter. If you don't get the VegNet, actually we're putting it together right now to get that out here yet today, but we put this out once a week during the season and then in the off season, in the winter months, we put it out. Uh, May once a month just to give updates on different schools and programs that are going on. But we'll take information from Purdue's ID or even Kentucky's uh, pest management newsletter. Things that are pertinent that if they're seeing it in Indiana or Kentucky, more than likely we're going to see it coming here to Ohio uh, pretty soon. So if you're not subscribed to VegNet, just go to vegnet.osu.edu and click on the subscribe button. 
and you can get these weekly updates on, on what's going on throughout the state. Uh, this week there will be a lot from Monday's tour, I'm sure, some pictures and some updates what's going on in the, in the high tunnels we visited the other day. Um, I wish we could have Jim had some more time yesterday, but Jim heads up our, our IPM program in Ohio, and that's why we worked with uh, Jim on partnering for this training this week. But lots of good information in terms of integrated pest management on lots of different crops, agronomic crops, fruit and vegetable crops, on the ipm.osu.edu uh, website. Now I mentioned SAIR, the, the opportunities you might have available to you if you want to do some of your on-farm testing or do some IPM type work on your farm. Um, but we're in the North Central SARE region, and that would be the website that you would use to go and you can actually subscribe to that too. They'll tell you when the call for proposals are coming out for the farmer rancher program and different educational type SARE, SARE proposals that you can get to help uh, fund some of your uh, on farm research if you're interested in that or to help implement an IPM program on your farm. So, with that, I th is there any questions? One thing I do want to point out, and you guys can pick these up if you want. Um, Getting that early diagnosis and early identification is very important. And here in Ohio, just like Kentucky, just like Indiana, we all have a plant and pest diagnostic clinic. Because there's some of these things that we see out in the field. You may have all the books and the pictures you want, but still, even our pathologists and our entomologists sometimes aren't 100% sure of the identification of these certain pests and diseases and they almost have to go through a culturing process within the lab. You almost have to grow them out, um, culture some of these diseases in a, in a chamber or something. So the plant pest diagnostic clinic used to be at Ohio State campus, right on campus, but when they built the new uh, wing of the Department of Agriculture, they actually built a brand new plant and pest diagnostic clinic out at the Department of Agriculture. So you no longer drop your samples off on camp. Well, you can still drive. they got a box there. But if you want to go right to the lab, you go right out to Reynoldsburg. And these are the forms that you would fill out if you have a, uh, a disease leaf or insects. If we can't identify it here, your county educator can identify it. Uh, you can send it to our plant and pest diagnostic clinic and then the county educator, whether it's Jeff uh, in this county or me in Scioto or wherever, they'll actually get uh, the results of your, of your uh, submission to that clinic as well. So these are laying up here if you want to take one of these uh, home with and you can copy them all, but this is how you would uh, submit for good identification culturing of your, of your pest and disease you see. It's all on, if you go to the ppdc.osu.edu website, they'll actually tell you how they want that, uh, how they want that, pack, uh, that sample package and submitted. Number one, I can tell you, don't send it on Friday because it's going to end up getting laying in a hallway somewhere and if it is a, a leaf or it's an insect there's not going to be too much left come Monday morning and more than likely they won't look at it first thing Monday morning so the sooner in the week if you do have a problem or just drive it up to the lab and drop them off even if you did have a Friday sample and you really want it because between Friday and Monday a lot can happen uh, in that short period of time. So a good, quick diagnosis will, will help you. But you can drive it. Nancy Taylor is our lab manager. You can drive it right up there. A lot of farmers have driven it up on 2 o'clock Friday afternoon and uh, had that sample cultured and diagnosed right there so they had an answer going into the weekend can implement a control, control strategy. Um, next day mail, if you are going to mail, I always like to have them drive it right up there, but if you can't, uh, next day mail, uh, in order to get that, f that sample as fresh to the, to the lab as possible. Um, a fresh sample, go right to the field, package it. Don't usually put, uh, don't put it in a, uh, a Ziploc bag because a moist sample in a Ziploc bag is not going to be too good a shape by the time it gets up there. But if you wrap it in some uh, paper towels and then put it in a box or, or something that gets it up there real fast, um, but they have on their website, go to the Plant Pest Diagnostic Clinic website, and they'll tell you a whole rundown of, on how they would like to see you package and set, uh, submit those samples. Any questions? Yeah. You made a comment just a little while ago about uh, using a lot of water. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a very good question. Does adding the active ingredient that's recommended on the label by putting in more water, does it dilute it down any? I think that's sort of what you're getting at. Really, if you have that sprayer calibrated and you know this row of tomatoes in the high tunnel is going to take 20 gallons of water because that's what it's going to take to wet that at walking at this speed, 
it really doesn't matter as long as the amount of active ingredient you need for that row. If the plants are real small, you're probably going to need 10 gallons of water. But if they're full-grown jungle, in order to get that same amount of pesticides spread throughout that entire plant canopy, you're going to have to use more water to get it to soak down in there. So really, you're not diluting anything, really, as long as you're putting on the same amount of active ingredient. On that. Right, more spray solution is what you're at. You're not messing with your active ingredient, your labeled rate uh, for that particular area you're covering. Uh, while we're on, we just got a couple minutes here, but linear acreage. A lot of people, especially when you're taking some of these field labels and taking it into a tunnel type of a situation, and you're maybe only making an application to one row, um, a broadcast rate sometimes is on the label as for a broadcast acre. Think about if you're just making a linear or bed acreage application. If you're just targeting, you're not spraying in between those rows, you're just concentrating that solution on that bed, that's called linear acreage or bed acreage. You just take the width of that bed times the length of that bed, come up with the acreage you have in there, and that's what you're using. You know, something planted on five or six foot centers, you could probably reduce your rate in half just by concentrating that spray. Because why would you need to really spray in between for a protecting fungicide or, a, or insecticide when there's nothing growing there? If you can ban, a lot of our, Fred Weaver, we were at Fred's the other day. Fred's taken that concept. He's always done a broadcast and I've talked to him for 20 years now and it's finally getting, getting into, his, into his way of thinking, but he's building a sprayer just to do his tomatoes. He's going to have one bed with cones all the way down over top of that uh, tomato row and he's only going to band apply all of his fungicides and insecticides right over that band because he's on six foot centers and he don't have much in between there to spray. So if you're going to be doing a linear acreage type of a type of a setup, remember that'll affect your, you're not talking acre fields no more, you're talking bed acres.